Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. <laughs> I like that enthusiasm. Coffee kicking in. That's really good. Uh, welcome to tonight's lecture sponsored by the Archaeological Institute of America, Salem Society, and Willamette Center for Ancient Studies and Archaeology, as well as the Archaeology Program. Uh, my name is Scott Pike, and I'm a professor in the Environmental Studies, I can't believe I said that, Environmental Sciences Department, as well as in the Archaeology Program. And I've, uh, I'm the chair, or what do we call it, president of the Salem Society of the Archaeological Society of America. Long title. Anyway, so uh, it's my duty to, and pleasure actually, to welcome you tonight. Uh, before we introduce the speaker, uh, and get on with the lecture. We always have sort of a traditional time for me to talk to you. And I encourage you to join the area. Before I do that, we are going to do our, 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 uh, our we can't call it a raffle for legal reasons, because we're supposed to advertise like 24 hours before a raffle what we're giving away. And we really never know until like a couple hours before. So uh, we don't call it a raffle, we're gonna call it a riffle. And uh, so we, we have in our Ripple uh, three books today. Uh, and if you want to participate in the Ripple, please just raise your hand. The, it's $1, one ticket, $5, five tickets. Uh, and what we do with these funds is they not only go to support the coffee and, uh, and cookies out in the front, but when we collect these monies, they actually go to part of our programming to be able to bring in speakers for our society members. So if you want a ticket, please raise your hand and Olivia and Ursula will come and find you and uh, take your money. Uh, the books are in the beginning, 10th uh, edition written by uh, Brian Fagan, uh, former president of the AIA. Uh, so, I mean, the big AIA, not just a society. So that's his book. We have Roy Ellen's Environment, Substance, and Systems, The Ecology of Small-Scale Social Formations. Archaeology students, this is something you really, really want. Okay. And uh, finally, Lives in Ruins, Archaeologists, and the Seductive War of Human Rubble. <laughs> Might learn something about myself reading this one. All right. So uh, those are your uh, the, the options that we have hands in the back. And while they go collect uh, your hard earned dollars, I'll talk a little bit about the AIA and the Salem Society and the Center for Interest Studies and Archaeology. So what isn't there to say? I mean, there's so much to say. The, the AIA is the US, uh, it's actually North America's oldest organization that uh, promotes archaeology. And it is an interesting organization in that it is made up of professionals, academics, and others who are just interested in our archaeological past. It is composed of societies, regional societies. So we are the Salem Society. And we have to maintain a minimum membership so that we can get uh, that, so that the national office can sponsor and send to us speakers of international acclaim. And these are speakers who will be speaking about archeology span that might be local to us, might be from Greece, Rome, South America, really it's a regional focus, Asia. We've had all, we have had speakers who focused on all sorts of things, but we need to maintain our minimum membership. So this is my plug. Please join if you haven't joined. I know NPR OPB just finished their fall capital campaign. And I know some of you feel that tinge of guilt for not joining. <laughs> but this is that opportunity for you to, uh, to, to correct that. But actually, if you're not a member, we do encourage you to join. Uh, we have out on our front table the pricing uh, for membership. It used to be simple, and they thought they'd give you options, and this is your choice. <laughs> many, many options, which I find a mess. Uh, what I would suggest if you want to join is that you join uh, the Salem Society, and you have an option of getting the magazine or not getting the magazine. 
Uh, the archaeology magazine is uh, comes out, I think, eight times a year. Uh, and it is uh, a non-specialist journal for those of you interested in archaeology. Uh, and with a year's membership, you get a subscription to this. You can join without a subscription, which costs $50. You can join with a digital subscription, which costs $50. <laughs> Uh, or you can join, uh, actually those, I'm sorry, those two options, it's so confusing. If you join for $50, you get no magazine. Oh, okay. If you join for $50, you can get the magazine. <laughs> but what they really want you to do is join for $130. No, go for 50. Let's go with 50. So for $50, you can join and get a print format of the, the magazine. And uh, if you go for $130, you get the print format of the magazine and a digital format of the American Journal of Archaeology, which is the professional journal. So much more uh, special, you know, specialized. Uh, so those are your options, 50 or 130. I'd probably go with 50 myself. Uh, the other thing we also encourage our membership to do is actually donate memberships, particularly for our student members. Uh, a student membership is $35. $35. It could be 25 if you don't want to give the student the magazine. <laughs> Oh, if you're retired. Okay. So it's $50 for no archaeology magazine, no journal. But if you're retired, it's $110. So for $50, anyway, I don't, maybe we don't want to make sure. But we do want the students. So if you're willing to donate to a, a, a student, uh, which uh, hopefully some, uh, some of you can, uh, it's $35. The student becomes a member of the AIA. And the students we uh, will be, you know, classical studies, art, history, archaeology, environmental science. But students who are interested in, in some aspect of the past. And we like to get them and join. They get the AIA. They, they become part of a professional organization. And it starts them uh, on their career. So, uh, if you're willing, please do that. Wow, that was a mess. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's now. So, I'll, I'm only a two. So, uh, the Center for Ancient States and Archaeology is also sponsoring us. I do want to uh, recognize Marina Meyer, which is there. She is our coordinator. Uh, the center is, is uh, part of Willamette's. Uh, Center for Ancient Studies and Archaeology, and it really helps support so many of the work, research, and programming that we do to look at our past, archaeological past, and our ancient past as, as well. So, uh, and if you want to donate to that, you're in that giving mood, we will certainly not say no. Uh, all right, so let us begin with the ripple. We always have someone who, uh, you know, someone in the audience. I saw you say hi. I did. So, I did. You can't win. Okay. But you know no one else. Okay. We're going to have uh... the last three numbers. <laughs> last three numbers. Seven, seven, nine. <laughs> You're coming down and grab your book. Uh, okay. And then our second choice, seven, eight, seven. Eight, seven. That's nice. <laughs> Over two times. <laughs> Probably the middle, but seven, nine, four. All right. Thank you. All right. We've hosted off three books. Doing good today. 
And um, it is my pleasure. Well, yeah, I have to Okay. <laughs> so let me introduce my very speedy uh, uh, colleague, Mary Bachbarba. She's a professor of classical studies here at Willamette, and she's also the program coordinator for the Salem Society of the AIA. And she really does most of the work for the society, putting it together, our lecture program. Uh, the easy part is when we get the national lectures, but Mary has really gone uh, out to find uh, interesting and engaging speakers from the Northwest region, which includes tonight. So, okay. thank you, Scott. And let me just preview our final lecture of this term, which will be December 2nd, which First. will be December 2nd with Dale Cross. He's doing wet site archaeology at uh, Native American sites, and he will be talking about how he reconstructs their basket making techniques. Um, with some examples that you will bring with us. And those of you who are students or AIA members, you're welcome to join us at the museum at four, where he will discuss and uh, do some stuff with one of the baskets and our museum collection that comes from one of the master artisans uh, whose work he's gonna talk about during the lecture. All right, so now I am pleased to introduce Nick Famoso. Can you hear me? Is it good enough? All right, Nick Famoso, who is the chief of paleontology and a museum curator at the um, John Day Fossil Beds uh, National Monument. He, uh, Nick is a Oregon native. He did his BS at South Dakota School of Mines and Technology, and then his MS and PhD at University of Oregon. He's uh, on the topic that he's gonna talk about tonight, I guess. Uh, mammalian community recovery from volcanic eruptions. He seems to be very interested in teeth, looking through his publications. <laughs> Quite a few things on that, but also thinking about how uh, national parks can um, engage in, I guess, scientific research just at the same time. And we we're gonna get an example of that right now. Please welcome Nick on talking about in the shadows of volcanoes, volcano ecology of groups of mammals around both modern and fossil uh, volcanic events. Okay, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here on the other side of the Cascades where it's nice and uh, wet. I'm, I'm used to very dry things and a lot of pokey plants. So it's nice to be back on this side of the Cascades again. Um, yeah, so, uh, um, yeah, I guess before I get started too far, I do want to mention um, that all of the places that I'm going to talk about today are going to be kind of put in more of a Western context, because that's kind of the mindset I was working on when I did this research, but also keep in mind that all the sites that I'm working on are from traditional area or areas where uh, our tribal communities have traditional use. Right, so um, all the I know the ones for my park at John Day Fossil Beds, which includes traditional use for the Confederated Tribes of the Warm Springs, Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, and the Burns Paiute. Um, and unfortunately, I never actually looked that up for the other volcanoes of my modern systems that I'm working in. Um, so I'm remiss in that I don't actually know the names of those tribes. Uh, but it is important to at least acknowledge the fact that these are from traditional areas, and many of these areas still do have. Uh, presence and use from those communities. Um, at any rate, yeah, I'll just go ahead and get, get started a little bit more about myself. So what does that mean, paleontology program manager and museum curator to National Park? Well, that means I am in charge of all the geology, all of the fossils that are in John Day Fossil Beds National Monument. Uh, I am also the museum curator, as was mentioned, which means I'm, and I am a paleontologist, um, not an archaeologist. But I am in charge of archaeology collections, which the Bureau of Land Management will probably be very sad to hear that they have a paleontologist in charge of the archaeology things. Oh, no. It's usually the other way around in BLM, Bureau of Land Management. Um, but yeah, so I'm in charge of all the museum collections that we have, which includes art, modern biological collections, uh, the historic collections, the pre-contact collections. So we have all that. So I won't be talking about anything else really except for the fossils. Um, but as at least something I wanted you all to know because national parks do have all these things. The purpose of the national park is to make sure the museum program is to make sure that we are preserving all of those resources within the park boundaries for future generations to enjoy. Uh, and that includes all of it, right? With all the regulations and everything that goes with being a federal employee. Uh, but at any rate, 
So I'll get started talking about shadow of volcanoes. Um, and this is a lot of what I did for my dissertation, which was a very, as was mentioned, a uh, very big uh, change from my work on fossil horse teeth. Um, but I was very excited to do some work on ecology. Ecology is a very interesting area uh, to study. So we know that life has been evolving around volcanoes for a very long time, right? Uh, there have been volcanoes on this planet longer than there have been than there has been life. Um, and we know that when volcanoes erupt, that they cause a lot of impact, right? I mean, there's ash fallout, like you see over on the left. Um, this wonderful image on the right is from Mount St. Helens. When it erupted, that's all of the trees that were killed by that eruption in 1980. Um, and that's that's a huge impact on the, on the ecosystem, right? And of course, that impacts more than just the plants, obviously, that, that involves everything. Right, so some other examples of the devastation that occurs from a volcanic eruption that includes things like tree topple, scorch, the tepper falls. So that's the ash that's actually falling down. There's a lot of examples of this, both in the archaeological record and the paleontological record. Um, so think um, think a place like Pompeii is a really good example of tepper fall. Uh, pyroclastic flows, these are things called ignimbrites, which is a geologic term. I like to refer to them as fiery clouds of death. Uh, because that is kind of what they are. They're these superheated glass clouds that come out of a volcano and they go whipping down um, at hundreds of miles an hour across a landscape and just bake everything, right? Um, then there's fluvial deposition too. So we get things like mud flows that come off of these volcanoes. And then everyone knows about lava flows, right? That's everyone learns about that at some point in school, at least here in the States. So um, those are a lot of things. And there's a lot of other things that happen with these two. Also, mud flows are also referred to as lahars. Uh, so that's another geologic term to refer to a mud flow from a volcanic environment. Uh, you also have earthquakes and a lot of other sorts of impacts, right? So these, they're bad news when they happen, especially for the area right around them. Uh, and sometimes they're bad news very far away, uh, but not always. Uh, so what do we know? Well, we know, as I mentioned before, there is a long history of life evolving in the shadow of volcanoes, right? Um, I like to say that everything dies, like locally, almost everything dies. Um, many things do come back. Um, and we know that geography matters, right? So if you're looking at a place like uh, South America, like right uh, by near Colombia, it's going to have a very different impact if a volcano erupts there than if you have a volcano erupt up in Alaska, right? The biodiversity is very different. There are fewer things in Alaska than there are down uh, around the equator. Um, and the other things that we do know quite a bit about um, are fish, birds, and plants. And this is mostly thanks to Mount St. Helens. So most of this knowledge is known since the 1980s. Um, but what we don't really know a whole lot about is mammals. And you may wonder, well, why don't we? And it's because mammals are hard to find and they run away and they hide in burrows and things. And they, they don't, nature doesn't really like to be contained if you've ever noticed that. But <laughs> this is one of those examples. Mammals are very bad at it. They're not sedentary. Um, and they're a lot harder to hear and see because they don't want to be found. Um, so that's the aim of what I'm interested in understanding is how do these communities of mammals respond to these events, right? And this is a lot of impacts for a lot of things. Being a federal employee in a land management agency, obviously there's the direct impact there. How are we going to manage the land after these eruptions happen? Uh, but this also can have impacts on agriculture, life in general, a lot of different directions this can go, right? So what are we talking about? Uh, evolution in volcanically disturbed areas. Well, the big thing that we have to deal with is um, just sort of this ecological change, right? You have an eruption, like in the upper left, or a new island that forms, for example, and then it's this slow succession of how long does it take for life to come back to the area, right? And life is everything from plants to insects to birds, mammals. And when does that ecosystem System, quote unquote, stabilize, right? When do you get to a to an ecologically stable environment? Uh, how long does that take? Do the same things come back? Those are the sorts of things that we aim to answer. I've been talking about volcano ecology. Um, and what exactly is volcano ecology? Well, put it very simply, it's the study of the interaction of volcanoes on the ecosystem and the ecosystem, right? And I have two cool examples here that I'll talk about very briefly. The one on the left is an artist depiction of a poor gopher that came out uh, after the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens and realized that all of his friends are dead, 
Um, and all of his ecosystem, his home is gone. Everything is gone, right? It's a terrible, terrible thing. Um, but he's still alive because he was living underground, right? Um, and that's a very recent one. But the one over on the right, right, yeah. This far one over here is another artist depiction. And that may look like a big ash cloud moving over Africa. But that is, in fact, a depiction of what it was anticipate, what we think it looked like um, during, <laughs> in Nebraska, 11.83 million years ago. This is a site called Ashfall Fossil Beds, and I'll show some actual examples of this later. Um, but Ashfall Fossil Beds is a site where there's about eight feet worth of ash that was deposited over a thousand miles from the volcanic eruption, which was in Idaho. And within that ash deposit, what you actually see <laughs> are approximately 300 three-dimensionally preserved skeletons in, of animals, including rhinos, horses, camels, musk deer, uh, crowned cranes, snakes, dogs. All these things were preserved in that environment and it's stratified in a way that we know it took approximately a month uh, for that all to happen, right? So these are some examples of really cool ways in which Volcanoes can preserve things in the fossil record or not, as in the case of uh, Mount St. Helens. So a little bit more on the technical side. This is kind of a, this is a nice you know scientific paper version of what volcano ecology looks like, right? So the big point here is you have an ecosystem. It's living its best life. It's doing its thing. It's very happy. And then there's a perturbation, right? There is a disturbance, a primary disturbance. A volcano erupts, and you get some legacy animals that stay around because not everything dies. Some things are okay. You get some soils that are still there and you get some organic matter that's still there. But then you have the problem of, in some cases, a quarter of an inch of ash. Big whoop, no big deal. Um, or you end up with eight feet of ash <laughs> in the case of astral fossil beds, as an example. Um, and that's going to very much change the entire ecosystem, right? Um, and so then when you have this sort of environment happen, you have these little refugias, but then things start to come back and fix up the area a little bit, and then you get dispersion from other source populations that come in and repopulate the area, so it may not look exactly the way that it did before, um, and then sometimes you have another eruption, and then everything goes out the window again, and then you have to come back and, you know, wait to see how long it's going to take for it to stabilize. Right. So that's sort of the, those are the mechanisms that go into volcano ecology. And but what does that look like if we're looking at species as an ecologist like I am, I'm a paleoecologist. What does that look like? Well, here's a cool example, two examples that we have here of birds. I mentioned birds were a really popular thing um, that we know a lot about with these and with uh, volcano ecology. And the two lines here, the darker line is Mount St. Helens. And the gray line is Circe. And if you've never heard of Circe before, um, in this context, Circe is an island that was formed off the coast of Iceland in, I believe, 2015, I think. Oh, no, 1963. I'm very wrong. It's in the 60s that that island came out. There's another island that happened more recently. Um, but this island, right, the, the, the main point of this one is when Mount St. Helens erupted, it didn't take very long for populations of birds to start coming back. So what's on the y-axis is the number of species. And what's on the x-axis is the years since the eruption. And as you can see, Mount St. Helens, it already had a background of birds that already knew it was there. They came back, it spiked a little bit, but it was a slow progression over time. So that's generally what we what we will see is the slow progression through time until, they, until it stabilizes and evens out. Um, though what we do notice about Circe as an island that popped out of nowhere that's really cool is that it took about five or six years before the birds to realize that there was a party going on over there at Mont Circe. And once they finally realized that there was this cool thing to go and do, um, they started migrating to the island. And then you see the slow accumulation year after year. Not every species is finding it right away, but once that starts, once the animals start to come across it, they start coming back. And then you start stabilizing a little bit more around 15, between 15 and 20 species of bird in that population. Keep in mind too, that this is a higher uh, latitude and it is also um, on an island. And island biomechanics work very, <laughs> ecology works very different than it does on a continent, right? So it's a lot easier for things to circulate on a continent. Uh, well, that's why we don't have as many species. But um, so that's kind of what we're looking for. We're looking for a pattern like this of slow and steady, gradual return of species. 
So what are some examples? Well, modern volcanoes are a really good place to look at, right? We know about a lot of these. We've got places like Mount St. Helens, Mount Lassen, which is Northern California. Um, and we already talked about the island off of Iceland. The Hawaiian Islands are really good for this. Lots of places in New Zealand, South America. <laughs> Italy has a lot too. Indonesia, Krakatoa was a really big one, right? A lot of these have problems though, and a lot of them don't have very good records before the eruption, or they don't have very good records after the eruptions, unfortunately. However, thanks to Mount St. Helens, we actually do have quite a bit. And so I'm actually gonna focus on Mount St. Helens and Mount Lassen as two island or as two volcanoes to focus on in this study. Now, why did I pick those two? Um, well, they're both continental, so they're both comparable, right? We're not dealing with the problems of islands and barriers keeping things away. Um, and Mount St. Helens since 1980 is very well studied. There is so much data about this volcano both geologically and biologically, it is absolutely insane what, what is available there. Um, and we have a really good record about five years afterwards for the biology, because I guess that's when the funding ran out. Um, but there's a lot of good record there for the biology. Um, and there's really good pre and really good post eruption data. Mount St. Helens is cool, 1980s, that's the one there. And it's a one year, one event. Uh, much big, oops, sorry, much bigger eruption too. Um, so that's one thing to look at here also. Mount St. Helens, uh, sorry, I keep saying that, Mount Lassen, between 1914 and 1917, it was a continuation of eruptions. It was a lot, a lot smaller. And the great thing about this one is we actually have data from right after the eruption to 100 years later. So we can look to look, at, so we can look at that long time span and it does this have a long-term impact. Um, and like I mentioned, it is a smaller eruption. It's basically just mud flows that are being preserved in that, unlike the, the ash fall and all the other things that were happening with Mount St. Helens. There's not nearly as much ash that came out of these eruptions of Mount St. or of Mount Lassen. Um, now, the other thing is, how do we really know for a fact that these are really the volcanoes and not just climate? Well, very rarely in a paleontologist's life do, do, do they get to use a control system in their science, and this is where I get to do that. So I have Mount Rainier and Mount Shasta as my two uh, comparisons, right? They're outside of about 30 kilometers away from the volcanoes I'm interested in. And why that is important is because most of these volcanoes had a physical impact about 30 kilometers away, right? So now I can say it's certainly not because ash from Mount St. Helens was impacting Mount Adams. So I'm not using Mount Adams. <laughs> I'm using Mount Rainier instead. Um, and they're both relatively close, so they're relatively the same latitudes, so similar, more similar ecosystems, right? Um, so with that, um, I'm going to jump into some actual data that I have, starting with Mount St. Helens. So what I have here for Mount St. Helens, uh, that very bright blue line that's kind of hard to see, that's the Rainier line, and the red line is the Mount St. Helens line. The y-axis is species richness, so this is the number of species, um, and then you have years on the bottom. The volcano is representing that exact eruption. And just to make it clear, the eruption, everything that's in the 1980 line is everything post the eruption in May. And everything that's on the other side is every possible data point that there was prior to the 1980 eruption. So that includes some things from January, February, March, and April of 1980. Um, and the cool thing about this method that I used here, this is called chow richness. So it looks at the number of specimens that you have and it calculates uh, based on the specimens, how many species should actually be there. And then it says there's error in that. So then it throws an error bar on there, right? So now I can estimate, I have an estimate, and then I have an error range of how many species should actually be there given the amount of data that I have for each one of these time bits. Um, and you'll notice that some of these are really big, the error bars. That means I don't have quite as much data as the other ones. Um, but the one thing that you can overall kind of see is that both of them do kind of have a, you know, one of those curves, like that succession line, right? They're kind of like that. Um, but that red line is a lot sharper than the blue line, right? So there probably is some effect of climate in this, right? That's that's being drugged down by that, that blue line. But also not really in all cases, because that line is very, very, is a lot steeper than the other one. Right, so that suggests that there's definitely some recovery from 
the volcano and not necessarily from climate, though the climate is still having an impact on this. Um, and the numbers that we're seeing on the far right of the graph are pretty close to, at least for Mount St. Helens, pretty close to what you see on the left, right? So maybe that you're seeing is that dip and then it stabilizes again about it, what it had before the eruption. Um, so this is suggesting that we have short-term recovery and it looks like there is some succession here, right? It's not the strongest argument for succession, but there is some, right? It's pretty cool. Um, and this, again, these are all mammals and these were all museum data. So this is all stuff that was collected, uh, like things that were killed or picked up dead and then thrown into museums. And there's probably about 20 museums I, I collected data from for this, right? So there's, for this part of it, there's probably about 3000 specimens, 3000 um, museum objects. Right, so then we'll move to Mount Lassen. So now we're, we're moved all the way down to Northern California. Um, and the red line again is Mount Lassen and the blue line is our control, that's Shasta. Uh, time again is on the bottom and the chow richness number of species is on the left, on the Y. Um, and then you have your volcanic eruption there right about 19, 1914. Um, and what you'll notice there, um, we'll ignore the blue line real quick and we'll just focus on the really easy to see red line. Um, it's pretty flat, right? There's not a whole lot going on there. And there's three bins and it's pretty much down straight. Now, the one thing that I will point out is that the museum at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, the, the modern biology museum there, they collected a ton of fossils, over 3,000 in this part right here, just in that part, they did a transect through a big part of Northern California, collected about 3,000 specimens just from that one point. And then the University of California Museum did it again in 2015. So I've got 3,000 on one end and 3,000 on the other, and they're both collected exactly the same way. And there's a drop in species diversity over a hundred years, right? So that right there, there is climate that is changing that, right? That is very clear. The blue line is doing something very different. And I'll explain why that's a little bit different in a minute. It's mostly due to how the specimens were collected, not necessarily to do with the actual biology. Um, but we're not really seeing any long-term changes in this case. And the two lines are generally doing about the same thing, which is going down, except for the one in the, that point in the middle, and that point in the middle is entirely messed up because of data, the way the data were collected. Um, but what's really cool is that we can see that it is not really being impacted all that much by that volcano, which is kind of what I thought would happen. Um, but you know, we also don't have a really strong record uh, beforehand to know that, but if it's matching in that way, it's probably a climate signal and not a volcano ecology signal. So with Mount Lassen, the fauna appears to be relatively stable, though there is a general decrease through time over a hundred year time scale. Uh, climate is clearly a big player in this, in this ecosystem. Um, and maybe that means that the Mount Saint or Mount Lassen eruption is just too small to matter in this case. Um, so, but we're just looking at the number of species. There's a lot of other ways to look at ecology. And there's a very cool method that I like to use called a non- non-dimensional, non-multi-dimensional scaling, which basically looks at similarity and distant differences between different sites um, and puts them all on the plot. And the further away they are from each other, the more different they are, right? So here's an example of this for what we have. And don't really mind all that much what NMDS1 and NMDS2 are. There aren't there mathematical things that um, don't really matter in this context. What really matters is the distance away each of those words are from each other and how long those lines are, right? So the first thing we'll notice is that the hot colors, I should have done it the other way. The hot colors are in Washington and the cool colors are in California, right? But what we notice there is there's a very clear divide between California and, and Washington. And what would be in the middle is our lovely state of Oregon. And thank goodness it's working because those things should not be close to each other. And that is exactly how it came out. They are very different parts of the world. And so they come out differently. So yay, it's working. Um, but when we go in to look at the minutia here, that's kind of where, where things get a little bit more interesting, right? So you can see those orange, po those two orange ones in the middle are Rainier pre and Rainier post, right? And then the dark ones are Mount St. Helens pre on the bottom and post on the top, right? So what that is suggesting is that the pre Mount St. Helens 
community is very different. And how, what this is looking at is not only the names of the species, the numbers of the species, but also how evenly all the species are, are distributed between all the sites. So I'm trying to get as many possible things in here to look at why, to look at how similar these sites are. And this is taking all these into account. So pre Mount Saint, pre 1980 community at Mount St. Helens is really different from Mount, um, <laughs> Mount Rainier. And then the environment that comes in after seems to be more similar to Mount Rainier than it was to Mount St. Helens before the eruption, right? Which then kind of goes to, well, there's probably these source populations from places like Mount Rainier that are coming in to help support the environment or fill in these vacant niches that are left by all the animals that have died, right? So that's kind of cool, right? That we're able to pull that out and it's, it's different. Now, if you look over at Latin, Everything kind of all clumps together, which makes sense given what we were looking at before, and that this is long hundred years of not really a whole lot of stuff changing. Um, but this is the point where I'll talk a little bit about um, the that weird Mount Lassen point that's in the 30s to 80s that was this bin right in the middle. That was where they were collecting things very differently. So I mentioned in the in the first bin and the last bin that things were collected holistically. They went out and they captured everything they possibly could, whether it was through shooting them or through trapping them or whatever, uh, or finding them dead, that's how they collected. They non-discriminate everything, ours. Um, the 30s through 80s bin was, ah, you know what we wanna look for? We wanna look for chipmunks. Ah, you know what we wanna look for? We wanna look for badgers or something like that, right? So they're very targeted studies. So that changes everything given the number of specimens that are there. It, auto, it, it changes the diversity numbers because there are very specific targets for what they were looking for at different times of year and whatnot. And it's a bigger bin and there's reasons for that statistically why I had to do that. But when I went back and looked at the field notes, it was very clear that the methodology they were using was very different. That's part of the reason why that one is as different as it is. All right. so. What did we learn from those modern systems? Well, we learned that scale matters. A bigger volcano like Mount St. Helens obviously has a bigger impact on the ecology than a smaller one does. Um, there is some evidence of succession. Uh, there was some change to the players, right? And when I say that, that's referring back to that NNDS where I'm looking at every possible thing. Some of the species changed. So there's some of this uh, source populations that are migrating in. And climate is obviously still playing a big role. And there appears in these modern eruptions to be a five to 10 year turnaround or so. And is, are we really gonna, you know, it's like, like okay, that's good to know. It's about five to 10 years or so for an eruption about the size of Mount St. Helens. It's good to know. But can we look anywhere else, right? That's only two examples. That's great. But two points do not make a trend, right? That's a straight line. Um, so what else can we do? Well, um, there was an attempt during the Second World War to bomb uh, volcanoes, um, and I do not recommend doing that as a National Park Service employee. Uh, please, let's not bomb our volcanoes to try and make them erupt. Um, that is not a very good uh, way to manage anything. Um, so instead, what we could try to do is wait for something to erupt. But I mean, we're really good at knowing when volcanoes are going to erupt but not far enough in advance to get enough data to actually know anything about it, right? Um, we can get maybe a day or so if we're really lucky in certain parts of the world, and that's not enough to get in there and collect enough data to know anything eco ecologically. Um, but because you need a lot of data in order to do that. But what we can do is we can look to the fossil record. Here comes your paleontologist coming in, right? Um, so some fossils in the volcanic record. Uh, these are two favorite ones of mine. Blue Lake Rhino, this is one that was in the Columbia River basalts. If you're familiar with those at all, they make uh, the Columbia River Gorge, all those nice fires in there. Um, that basalt is all over the Northwest. And in fact, in one place in northern northeastern Washington, captured a fossil rhino about 29 or 16 million years ago. Um, and that is the cavity up there. Of, it's a little cave of a rhino that was captured uh, in a basalt. And it happened because it, the rhino was probably dead in a lake. And then the basalt flowed over it and captured it. Uh, and we know that because the basalt around it is what's called a pillow basalt, which is only happens when uh, lava contacts water. Um, so that's really cool. We, and there were, there were bones in it. That's so cool, right? 
Um, and then, of course, they were founded in the 1950s by the University of California, Berkeley, and they brought it down to the university down there. So if you want to see those fossils, you got to go down to Berkeley, unfortunately. But um, the cave is still there. Um, and the other site that I mentioned before, this is Ashfall Fossil Beds. This is one of my, I really like fossil horses. Um, and this is a great example of one of our fossil horses that we have there. Also really cool, there's the, the bones that are on top of it there, kind of in the boat, bottom right. Those are a rhino, that's a rhino skeleton, and it's about four or five inches of ash between it and the layer that that rhino is in. It's just so cool. You don't find stuff like this very often in the fossil record. It's super cool. Um, also very tragic. They all had a bone disease. They all because they were ingesting all the all the ash. It's really it's really sad when you think about it from that perspective. Scientifically, as a paleontologist, oh my god, it's so cool. Um, <laughs> this is why I study animals and not people. Uh, <laughs> But um, so then some other sites, uh, the one on the left there, this is one of those fiery clouds of death in Ignimbre uh, that was in Turkey. And there's a rhino skull that was captured in there and the poor thing was baked and cracked and it, it, it was probably already dead. I'm hoping it was already dead when that happened. Uh, but you do get some fossils preserved in that. And then this leads to why I'm here as a representative of John Day fossil beds, the John Day formation of Eastern Oregon. And what's really interesting about the John Day formation is that it is what we term as volcanic plastic, which means there's a lot of volcanic rock that has been worked into the sediment. There's also a ton of volcanic ashes. So there's a lot of volcanic events that we have in, in, uh, in our strata, in our stratigraphy. So I usually throw this slide in for people who are not from Oregon, but we all know what the state that we're living in, I hope. Uh, if not, there's Oregon. Uh, and then now that we're, so then we zoom in a little bit here and the green area there is everywhere where John Day Fossil Beds National Monument has collected fossils before. So that's our total area of the John Day Basin, what we refer to as. The little purple bits in there are the three units of John Day Fossil Beds National Monument. So those are the areas that I, as a National Park Service employee, um, are responsible for. In that area is also a lot of other property, including the Bureau of Land Management, the U.S. Forest Service, uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs, the tribes, uh, State of Oregon, Fish and Wildlife, private landowners. There's a lot of people that we work with in order to help tell this story about uh, where, where we work. And specifically where I'm going to focus on is that little red area there called the sheep rock unit. Um, and we're going to zoom in a little bit on this on the geology that we have. And what we can see here, there's a lot of green layers and there's a lot of yellow or uh, gray layers. All the gray layers are volcanic events, right? And for 400 meters worth of rock, that's a lot of ashes. Right. Um, there's at least, let's see, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven that have a date on them, which if I was still back in South Dakota, they would lose their mind over the number of ashes that I'd have to tell a, a ge geology story. The other thing that's really awesome is that we can get these little crystals out of the ash and we can tell approximately how old it is using uranium lead series of isotopes in order to determine how old these are. And we can get within about 10,000 year accuracy. Right. So for me as a paleontologist, plus or minus 10,000 years, is mind-blowingly good, right? Um, right, And I can only use things like uranium lead or potassium argon. I can't use things like carbon, right? Because carbon's only good for like 5,000, right? Um, so we have a lot of good uh, page numbers in our book. And the other thing to note too is that you, it's probably hard to see, but there are these letters along the side. Each one of the, the little sub layers in the Turtle Cove, remember the green rocks of the John Day Formation, um, are, are lettered between A and K2. So I call it the alphabet soup. So when I refer to the alphabet soup, that's what I'm talking about there. And they're all in sequential order from A, B, C, D, et cetera, et cetera, with A being the oldest and K being the youngest. Um, and I have this wonderful photo up here. This is a, one of our big features in the park called Sheep Rock. Uh, Sheep Rock is a very amazing site. It's a very cool area. There's all those ashes you can see in there. That big brown stripe right through the middle, that is a super volcanic eruption that came from Crineville, right? This is called the Picture Gorge Ignimbrite. It's about 100 feet thick, and it is a fiery cloud of death Ignimbrite that came hurtling over the landscape all the way from Crineville, right, to where I am near John Day. It's a very long distance to go. It's very thick, very superheated. We get logs, like trees, standing trees in the base of it. 
it is absolutely insane to think about what it would have been like here in Oregon when that erupted. Um, and we also know for a fact um, that it is associated with the Crooked River caldera, which is that big, you can see that there's a, where Prineville is, there's a big red blob around it. That is the caldera that was around it. And it's a super volcanic eruption. And we know that because it has hot spot signals for it. So think Yellowstone. Right. In fact, it may be the same hot spot that causes Yellowstone today that caused that eruption 29 million years ago. Right. Uh, which is really cool that we have that sort of thing expressed in, in, in Oregon. Right. And these other little bits that are up there, the gray, uh, the gray facies that are up there, uh, those are the exposures of the John Day formation. So that's just kind of giving you context as to where the, the formations and sites are in relation to that um, eruptive center. So we've set the stage. We have lots of volcanoes going off, which a lot of them are probably coming from the Cascades area. And then you have this big super volcanic eruption, caldera forming eruption that would have produced the superheated cloud of gas that comes out of the landscape uh, 29 million years ago. And then some more ashes and things. So that's kind of what we're, what we're dealing with. So we'll do the same thing we did earlier where we've got our rich species richness over on the left and our geologic time bins on the bottom and our important volcanic eruptions I put in as um, these little volcanoes and the really big one, that's the ignimbrite, right? So what we notice there is that it kind of fluctuates back and forth here and there. Um, and then right after the event, the big eruption, the, the ignimbrite, it kind of goes up a little bit, but there's a lot of error in there. So not quite sure. And then it drops. And then it slowly kind of does the same curve that we were seeing with that succession line again, right? So it's like, oh, maybe there is some things that are going on with succession there. Um, so now let's look at those players again by looking at my favorite graph, the NMDS. Oh. All of our letters are up there. I'm sorry about the red. I, I, I wasn't able to get those off when I did that, but each one of those red things is a species name. Um, and so that kind of helps me to remind you to tell you why all the things are clustered like that. But you can see the little black clusters, right? There's one that's kind of down in the lower right. And there's one that's kind of more in the upper left. And then there's this one that's clear off in the, in the upper right, right? So you got these three distinct clusters. Well, the big cluster with all of the black letters together, that's everything before the ignimbrite. Everything before the ignimbrite in that area. Interesting, right? The little cluster that's up in the upper right, those are the layers right after the ignimbrite for the first three of them. And then the ones that are down in the bottom are all the other ones after that. Interesting, okay. Well, who are those players? Who are those species that we're talking about? Well, this is another way of depicting all this. So we've got the geology with the oldest on the bottom and the youngest on the top. Um, that red line is representing our ignimbrite, our, our fiery cloud of death. Um, and then what we have here are families of animals. Most of these are extinct. Um, and how wide they are, the blue lines, how wide that is, is how common they are in the, in the thing. So the wider it is, the more common the animal is. The shorter the line is, the less common it is, right? Or the, the yeah, that's how that one works. So the big one in the middle, that is a thing called a hypertragulate. What is a hypertragulate? Have you ever heard of a chevrotain or a musk deer or something like that? These little cute bread box sized deer things that live in Southeast Asia today. That's what those were. Where do they like to live? They love forests. I absolutely love forests. Um, what are some of the other ones? Oreodonts. If you're not familiar with oreodonts, they're these sheep camel pig like things that kind of do whatever they wanted on the ecosystem. They're very weird little animals, um, but they also prefer their browsers. So they prefer closed habitats, they prefer forests. Um, we've got dogs, canids over here, um, next to them, I should say, next to the oreodonts. And then you got rhinos. And then actually, I have a, uh, it's not going to show. Okay, never mind. And then there's some other things. There's some horses in there. Of course, I got to throw horses in there. But horses were browsing horses back then. They weren't grazers. Um, and then, uh, but we see those are really common before that red line, right? They make up a lot of that area. They're really common. And that's interesting because all these animals really, really like forests, right? But then after that red line, they're almost non-existent. They're really, they're very rare. But then if you look over further to the left, on the other side of the big hypertragulate line there, Everything below that red line is pretty thin. And then once the red line happens, they start to expand. They're a little bit more common. What's going on there? Well, if you're familiar at all with things called um, apodonids, or which is a, a mountain beaver, or uh, lagomorphs, which are rabbits, 
um, or a lot of other different things in there. There's crycetids, which are like rats and mice, right? Those are all the things that are taken off, rodents, small things. Why might that be? Well, a lot of those animals like to burrow. It's hard to do that when there's tree roots everywhere, right? So those animals prefer more open habitats, right? So what we might be seeing here based on the animals is a closed habitat that's getting wiped out by a super volcanic eruption as being replaced by animals that are more open habitat adapted. Things that like to burrow, things that like to live um, in those sorts of areas. So what might that look like? Our, our wonderful environment that we had at the time, we got some depictions of some of these animals. We got our mouse deer hiding over there. We've got false saber-toothed cats, a couple of burrowing beavers, a thing called an entelodont, which is sometimes called a hell pig or a terminator pig. Biggest thing on the landscape, very scary. Three-toed horses that were browsers, lots of clawed animals, things that really liked closed habitats. We also have one of the highest diversities of canids, of dogs we've ever seen. There's 12 co-occurring species, 10, 10 or 12. They're doing the job of weasels because there weren't weasels back then. Really cool. Um, but then we have the eruption and we see a huge drop in the number of species and what's there. Um, and then we slowly start to see other things come back like our rabbits and then our horses start to come back again too. Um, so what did we learn from the John Day formation? Well, size really does seem to matter in this case, right? The super big eruption comes in, wipes out everything, but climate is still important, right? Because not everything was perfectly the same through all those layers. There's definitely some fluctuations in there, right? So overall, our conclusions are that volcanoes produce an amazing fossil record. Um, there, the scale of the eruption really does matter. Bigger eruptions have bigger impacts and they last for longer. Um, and then there's, of course, succession that we're seeing in some of these things and migrant populations play a really big role. Um, and before I go too far away, I do want to mention, so one of the other things I want to do, which is more of a modern biology thing, is look at reproductive strategies, right? So like, how does the relationship between our selected things, which produce lots of babies like rodents, um, versus things like us and elephants that are case selected that spend a lot of make a lot of investment in our children. Um, how does that relationship change through time too? That's something we should be able to see. Everyone always says, "Oh yeah, there's more rodents that appear immediately after an eruption like that, or weeds, right? Weedy plants, um, and that's what they do. Low low parental investment. Uh, lots of individuals get spit out, right?" versus things like elk and deer, um, which take a little bit longer. And I did do a research paper where I quantified this uh, as to what, um, how reproductive strategy, um, how it changes in relation to body mass and diet. And this is something I wanna look at in, with relation to uh, volcano ecology and see if those patterns change through time and the degree to which it does change. Um, so stay tuned, hopefully someday I'll be able to have time to work on that. However, uh, that is not for now. And with that, uh, these are the uh, acknowledgements I'd like to give. And I'll take questions if there's any time for that. Yes, any questions? I was curious about like the collaboration that you mentioned between like when you're doing an excavation or getting data between like private landowners or tribes and government organizations and what like maybe some of the problems are, but also some of um, like the success stories you've had. Sure, yeah. So if you didn't hear the question is uh, to talk a little, expound a little bit on the relationship between the national park, the private landowners, all the different partners that we work with in collecting fossils and any sort of success stories or problems that we have, right? Um, so in general, I tend to stick to, to what I have the authority to collect in, which is the National Park Service land. I have authority granted to me by the superintendent of the park to go and collect those data. Um, so that's the easiest one for me. Um, we do have some partnerships with private landowners. A lot of people in Eastern Oregon are like, yeah, you know, fossils are cool, but if you have a use for them, sure, like we'll give you permission. You can take them from our property, right? And always get permission to collect off of private land. Um, but also I have a, a partnership with the Bureau of Land Management. I have a permit that's issued to me every year that allows me to go out on their land. And I'm actually designated in a special agreement to um, assist them with <laughs> all of their lands east of the Rocky, sorry, not Rockies, God, I'm tired, uh, east of the Cascade Mountains in the state of Oregon. 
Right, so I have a designated partnership, and this partnership has existed since 1987. So it's about as old as I am. Uh, so there is um, so there is that sort of partnership. That's a formal partnership. Now the partnerships we have with the other agencies haven't really been formalized as well. Um, and the tribes, we have a bunch of stuff on loan from the Confederated Tribes for Warm Springs, and that's all we have right now, uh, which is specifically from their tribal land. Right, so we went in, got permission to go in, collect the things, they loaned it to us. We have it in our possession at the park. Um, and that's where they currently are being held. Um, and they obviously they knew about it. We had a conversation about it, right? It's always about getting permission ahead of time, getting the permits. Because when you put anything into our museum, we have to make sure that we have all the legal documentation that says that we have the right to have it, right? We have to true prove chain of custody in a park service museum. Not all, not all <laughs> park service museums are. Perfect at that, because uh, sometimes people loan you things and then they die and then they don't have a clear custody chain after they passed away. Uh, so put that in your will, folks, if you're donating things like that or loaning things. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the long and the short of that story. I could do a whole hour talking just about that. So. Thank you. You're welcome. And yeah, you were using uh, fossils to interpret past climates, which is really cool. I was wondering if there's any uh, botanical evidence to support the conclusions. Yeah, so the question is about uh, if there are any paleobotanical data to support these conclusions as well. Um, unfortunately, one of the big problems with the Turtle Cove member is that there are very, very few macro fossils of leaves. So we do have some, but it's only from one horizon. And the other problem that we have is that that nice green color um, it's created through a process called zeolitization, which is a it's, it's a process that happens uh, when you've been buried when you have rock that's buried for a long time and water percolates through and it changes the, the minerals. Um, and when it does that, it not only destroys all the pollen that was in there, but it also destroys phytoliths. And phytoliths are these little silica balls that are contained inside the leaves of plants. Uh, so all those are obliterated. The University of Washington came down to try and find those things to no avail. However, we can use paleosol data, so fossil soil data uh, can tell us a little bit about the, those environmental changes. Uh, and there's some other geochemical things that we can get at. Uh, but those data are kind of messy because of that secondary alteration. So really the best way we have to answer those questions currently is through the vertebrate fossil record. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about the microbial communities. Right. So the question is about microbial um, communities and if there's any evidence of those being impacted. So unfortunately, microbial data with terrestrial deposits like this are really hard to find. We have, in fact, the closest thing we have to that is deposit from about 40 million years ago, 40 to 44 to 40 million years ago, that has some hyphae of fungus. And that's the closest thing that we have really to that. That's a really good record. However, we do have some foraminiferin data. So from the lakes, there are these little tiny microbes that leave their shells behind from some of the lake deposits. But unfortunately, this horizon, there are no lakes that that's preserved in. Um, so that's one of the problems with the fossil record. It's like, I, you know, all these great ideas, like, oh, could you look at this? Could you look at that? It's like, yeah, we looked and the data are in there. That's one of the, the hard parts about the fossil record is there's so many gaps like that. Hey, I got two questions. The first one is uh, the asphalt fossil uh, that, how solid is the rock that's formed from that? Is it like sandstone or is it like basalt? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, this is related to asphalt fossil beds in Nebraska. And how solid is the ash that makes up that? Um, when you first encounter it, it's hard. But as soon as you break it in any way, like if you like once you get it to break a little bit, um, it turns into powder. Like it is it is like picking up ash from Mount St. Helens after you started working in it a little bit. But when you initially like the initial compaction has made it very hard. Um, and once you disturb that, um, it just basically just becomes powder. It was actually really dangerous to work in because uh, we were actually digging in it, building the foundations for a new building. And <laughs> my hat from that year still is is silver uh, from all of the ash. It's very sparkly. Okay. So. Hey, second question. How big is Oreodon? Oreodon. Okay. Well, it depends on the kind of Oreodon. So Oreodons, there's one kind from Southern California called Cespia, which is about this big. 
Um, and then there's one called Promeric Acarus that we have in Oregon that was the size of a really big pig, like, like 300, 400, 500 pounds, whatever. Some of them look like pigs. Some of them look like sheep and were very gracile and very runny. Um, but they range in size from about that big to this big. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, looks okay. One yeah, more. Okay, one more. So, yeah. you know, on the one hand, it makes sense that burrowing animals would survive this kind of eruption. On the other hand, um, you'd think that they would be kind of stuck under the ground. Right. You know, and it takes probably a long time. I don't know how long it takes for lava to cool or even right. for the ashes to cool. Right. So, how do they survive without starving to death? Or right. Exactly. So, with a lot of the a lot of the ash deposits, because they're so distal, they're so far away, they actually are air temperature when they fall. Um, so that so the the heat from a, a regular ash fall is not as big of a deal for them. And most of the time, those those smaller eruptions, they're like that big, right? So it's not that that big of a problem. It's so when you start getting into these welded things like an ignimbrite. Um, where because there are smaller ones that are still pretty thick, right? There's some that are like five, six feet thick yeah. and they weld, right? So they become hard as rock right on top of everything. And we do actually have some records of rodents burrowing beavers actually that are trapped in the ignimbrite at the base. So we know it was going into the holes and killing them. Yeah. Um, but where the ash was able to deposit or where the ignimbrite was able to deposit, those animals probably didn't make it with those thicker deposits. Because there's paleo topography, there's other places where that didn't get deposited. So if there was a higher plane, maybe a mile or two away, they would be able to survive there and then migrate out into those other areas as they produce more offspring um, into these open areas. Because what we also notice too is that oftentimes when you have those open areas, it's things like rodents that are turning up the soil um, and a lot of and, and grasses and things that are starting to do that initial breakdown of the environment. That's what's creating that first soil that stabilizes the ecosystem long term. So those animals are really important to get in, and they're probably coming in from these tiny little refugia that are around the area, not necessarily from where there were the big thick deposits. Because we do see it very thick in certain places, but in others, it's very thin to pinching out to be non-existent. Uh, but those are very few and far between because you don't get deposition in areas where there's highs. So then you just you don't have a record there to know what was living in that area. It's kind of a catch twenty two. But yeah, no, that is a, that is a good point. Um, but and it's kind of hard to tease it out, and it's something that's almost impossible to actually identify the evidence of that specifically in the fossil record. You have to do some interp interpretation based on modern systems. Well, Nick will certainly be available for more informal questions, uh, but I'll let anyone who has other things to do head on out, and uh, anyone who wants to ask more questions can come up to the front.